a little tribal sounding opening an unreleased track that uh, I've been working on that sort of reflects tribalism as a force as a beat a rhythm of life that drives people maybe on one hand it drives them together into some sense of uh, community we all do the same tribal dance we all do the same tribal cooking we all do the same tribal lessons whether those are bible studies or other forms of getting together perhaps virtually using the internet using facebook using groups using whatever technology is available to meet with other people who find the same rhythms the same beats the same interests the same beliefs as you do finding your tribe is that what the issue is as we look at uh, the theme of the book that I'm writing the grace of uncertainty or maybe it's what I have referred to in my previous podcast in this series religion is poison and that tribalism is just reinventing old notions of I know more than you my beliefs are better than your beliefs and I'm right and you're wrong when you get ensconced in that position there's no way to negotiate there is no compromise to be found there is no middle ground so in politics these days and speaking as a canadian uh, the liberal and conservative throw in the ndp and the greens because you might as well take a look at some of the leading um, political parties in canada there has to be compromise and we have a multi-party system in Canada that has emerged to bring what I hoped would be compromise which would bring the best policies for all in political philosophy my my mantra is excuse me a floating uh, a rising tide floats all boats and the boats would be everybody in society whether you are rich whether you are middle class, whether you are poor, whether you're an immigrant, a new Canadian, whether you are just getting a leg up, you're living in an apartment, or you've managed to purchase a home and you have a multi-generational uh, family living there because all hands on deck helps pay the mortgage. And once that mortgage is paid off, then money exists to help others in the community. Families helping each other as opposed to divide and conquer. Um, I've always wondered about that. A rising tide floats all boats. Doesn't matter who you are, the color of your skin, doesn't matter your political philosophy, your social philosophy, doesn't matter your culture, doesn't matter your history, it doesn't matter your education level, your language, it doesn't matter. And I'm thinking we need to get back to some of that because tribalism really does seem to be a theme and it's maybe more so evident in the post 2016 US election with the rise of Trump and Trumpism magaism um, and perhaps uh, since I'm speaking from this vantage point in the timeline of life it is post the release of Trump's NFT non fungible tokens his series of cards or JPEG images, since they're virtual, I don't think there's an actual physical product. But you give a hundred bucks, ninety-nine dollars, and you are getting a JPEG of a super Trump, an astronaut Trump, a whatever Trump. Who buys these things? What tribe do they belong to to become so uh, willing to part with their hard-earned money? in a day when people on the right are complaining about inflation being caused by Biden or Trudeau or whoever you want to blame, of high gas prices being caused by Biden or Trudeau or whoever you want to blame. And the finger pointing and wagging goes on and on. So I'm wondering how this has impacted the religious community. And that is the context for the book, The Grace of Uncertainty. If I am less sure, less confident of what is truly right and truly wrong, absolutes. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that we could find some middle ground. 
But if, as Christians have often uh, said in their choruses and hymns, on solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, well, what is that solid rock on which you claim you are standing? And why is that the solid ground and not someone else's belief? Because, after all, belief is just that, belief. What is the evidence to support these doctrines, these dogmas as I refer to them, these, this body of knowledge, this body of beliefs that has been handed down for thousands of years? Christians would argue that their confidence is in their documents, in the archaeology, in the Bible translators, in the uh, understanding of the continuity. Progressive revelation puts the context on all these things that, you know, even though Yahweh, Elohim, and Jehovah are three different names for the Old Testament version of God, and we are supposed to, if you believe these ancient texts, you're supposed to call God by his name because he calls you by his name. If my people which are called by my name. So names, okay, which one? Uh, is it the Elohim tribe? And what kind of God is that? And is it the Yahweh tribe? And which God and what are his characteristics? How about Jehovah? What are his characteristics? Are they different or are they three different names for the same thing? The questions remain. And questions are good. Questions help steer us towards what we believe would be the truth. So what is the tribal affiliation that people have decided that they will stand on this ground and not yield one bit more. Well, this day and age, it seems, as I've referred to, seems to be a political base. It seems to be 30% uh, or so, maybe less, of America follows Trump and Trumpism and is firmly rooted there, and everyone else is moving on, leaving people behind. Maybe that is not a accurate in its entirety, that statement, leaving people behind, because progressive politics is about rising tides. It's about creating the social, economic, political, educational opportunities so that everyone, even the most marginalized, feels there is a place called home in America, in Canada, in Western democracies. And less and less, I think, is that the case. However, uh, rising tide floats all boats might be um, viewed, perhaps, as a rising tide sinks the leaky ones. <laughs> In other words, where you're sitting on the beach in the low tide, you don't notice that your boat is uh, rather not seaworthy until the tide starts to come in and then you realize... Your body of beliefs got a few holes in that thinking. So there are a couple of things that are coming to mind that I am using as I forge ahead in this book writing. One is an article that my brother sent me. Um, this is one from The Atlantic, and I believe it's the most recent Atlantic. The author is Peter Weiner. I, I think that's how you pronounce it, W-E-H-N-E-R. The evangelical church is breaking apart, and it goes on to look at the whole crisis in pastoring. Yes, pastoring, leadership in the evangelical church because what? Tribalism has infiltrated the church, and people, the congregation, people, are willing to challenge the traditional teachings in light of new ideas. Where are they getting these ideas? Well, maybe they are looking at things that they would put in a what I call a grab bag of contemporary grievance, which is social justice, Black Lives Matter, left of center thinking, uh, purge the conservative members, there is the anti-right, anti-right, anti-free speech. Yes, we're repressing free speech, are we now? Um, this is a church, remember. This is a church context. And this is kind of interesting because 
the article goes on to examine several pastors and why they're choosing to leave the profession. Do you call it a profession if you're a pastor, a minister? That's well, kind of interesting. Uh, disagreements with leadership, primary reason for leaving. Yeah, divisions and conflicts are intense. More intense than I've seen in 25 years of studying this topic, says Michael O. Emerson of the University of Illinois at Chicago. Research going on is saying things are not all well in the evangelical church. I'm wondering, is it any better in any church? And I would extend that to question all religious authority, where beliefs are founded on ancient texts, on documents, on oral traditions, and wondering... How do you prove belief? So I'm thinking historical context, and I think of the classic debates between the popes throughout history and the emerging sciences, the scientific revolution, especially the trial of Galileo as a demarcation point. And I'm thinking that we need to sort of take the road of what I would call the social gospel in Canada, the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, seemed to be a force to be reckoned with in Canada in the 1890s through perhaps as far as the 1930s. Eventually, the CCF becomes renamed and rebranded as the New Democratic Party. But what did they offer? I think the social gospel is the opposite of what white Southern Baptist evangelicals are offering today. So I'm taking that as a lesson. What did the social gospelers offer? Well, they offered an examination of the ills, the labor ills of an industrializing Canada. Remember, this was sort of at a time when Canada was, uh, well, in World War I, 1914, and I think that we're looking at a time frame before World War II. So there's a considerable growth in Canada in the late 1800s from Confederation. Let's use that as a marker just because it's convenient. 1867 to the 1890s, lots of industrialization. And there was lots of discontent as well. It's a time of prosperity, but a time of labor unrest. I'm wondering whether their ideas in that context might have some application to the 2020s in Canada or the United States or other Western democracies, the UK, France, Germany, uh, as the leading democracies. So I'm wondering about this whole idea of looking at solving social problems, of elevating everyone, and using reason to do it. So biblical criticism becomes really important at this time. We're talking again the 1890s to the 1930s in Canada. And it's guided by a central belief that God is at work in creating social change, creating moral order, perhaps, uh, their view of moral order. So I guess it would be based upon Judeo-Christian teachings of ethics and morality. And social justice. Social justice. Well, social justice isn't where Trump gets off uh, with his various, and I'm going to call them crimes because there seems to be enough publicly available data to suggest that his choices, his leadership, his uh, taking money while he was president, saying he wasn't going to take a salary, but getting all kinds of... Uh, foreign dignitaries to stay at his Trump hotels and charging them an arm and a leg. That's how you get, that's graft, that's corruption. So let's call it what it is. And it violates a number of American laws. And I'm hoping some of this will come to light. And I'm thinking that when a person carrying uh, marijuana is sent to jail for possession and Trump gets away with it, that there's something to do with social injustice. So how to get that changed? Well, you got to hold an optimistic view of humanity, not one where you think we all got to be the same, think the same, act the same, dress the same, uh, recite the same prayers. I mean, isn't that what 
churches do. You go in and you recite prayers. That links you as being one of the in people, the people who are part of this tribe, who march to this rhythm, this tribal call. The sounds of the drums are the sounds of onward Christian soldier. It sounds a little bit uh, warlike, tribal, this one, a little violent tribalism. But I'm wondering whether that is actually the Jesus of the New Testament point of view. I doubt, and I've said this before, I doubt Jesus would, would have labeled himself with any political affiliation. But if I could hazard a guess, I would say he was not conservative. He was anti-establishment, a uh, rule breaker in the sense that the rules that he encountered during his lifetime were considerably complicated and developed by uh, people, caste of people, class of people, Pharisees, Sadducees, people of religious instruction who thought themselves that everybody should do the same thing, and so here are the rules, and the compendium is hundreds of laws and rules rather than the Ten Commandments as guideposts for human behavior. So there you go. When we get to be certain of ourselves, we tend to draw the dogma lines, and there is no rising tide that affects everybody. There is simply... I want these laws, these sets of legislation to help my tribe. And that's not how government is supposed to work. In the case of the United States, it's supposed to be we the people, not we the some of the people, we the some of the people who were here first, we the some of the people who owned slaves, we the some of the people who control the businesses and enterprises of the American economic engine, it's really supposed to be simply we, the people. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. If you want to make that argument of God over all, then you have to extend that grace and dignity to all people, regardless of whether they believe exactly the same as you or not. There is grace in the uncertainty. Grace when you ask questions. Grace when you do not think that you know all and that you are smarter than everyone else. It's just, does what you believe hold up to questions? If it does, then perhaps you're on the right track. If it doesn't, then perhaps we need to tweak our tribal membership card to include some caveats, some things that, well, we used to have these caveats back in the 1970s and 80s in the uh, churches that I used to attend, please be patient with me, God isn't finished with me yet, as a caveat, a disclaimer to say, well, if I swore, I didn't mean to, well, if I lied, I didn't mean to, well, if I did this and you caught me stealing from the church coffers, I didn't do that really, I didn't mean to do it, you know, all kinds of excuses. And as I have encountered this quote from Gandhi, this is sort of one that I would like to use as an umbrella for everything that I'm writing about and learning about. Gandhi said of Christianity, I do like your Christ. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And there you go. If you can't walk the walk, if you can't talk the talk, then there's something wrong with what you are trying to do, or perhaps there's something wrong with the source. And I'm wondering whether that will offer some insight for people that maybe we need to think about what we do. There's a book called Jesus and John Wayne, which I've read and reread, and it offers an analysis of what may be happening. The same as this article by um, in the Atlantic on the evangelical churches breaking apart. And the analysis goes something like, the Jesus of the humble suffering servant view has been substituted by Jesus, the John Wayne militant crusader on a white horse with an AR-15. And are you going to go get him, as uh, George W. Bush used to say after 9-11? Going to go get him. Well, maybe we need some understanding in order, order to understand the position from which we are saying something like that, 
what is it that we are saying? There's a book that I want to get that's also uh, mentioned on, and I'm reading the, the Atlantic web version of this, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Sounds like something that would be worth looking at. So those are some things. Where am I going with all of this stuff? Simply to ask questions and to raise the possibility that uncertainty, not certainty, that uncertainty releases the chains of dogma that have been accumulated in the church since its inception, since the doctrines were decided at councils by older, schooled, apparently, white guys in a culture where women were not necessarily appreciated or valued, where it was okay to have slaves, where it was, you know, Jesus didn't say anything about slavery. Paul did, and he said, maybe you should go back to your master. And what? Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that needs to be reexamined and at least ask the questions, and from there we can have a discussion. But as long as we're entrenched and ensconced in tribal beliefs, beliefs that cannot be supported because they're mutually exclusive. You cannot say uh, everyone is free in Jesus and then say, but I'm more free than you. You can't deny the rights of others while saying, but I have rights in Jesus. You know, the kingdom of heaven. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Well, we all are then. And where are those rights extended? Anyway, those are some thoughts for today, having encountered um, through my brother an article called The Evangelical Church is Breaking Apart, posted in The Atlantic, and a little encounter with a slice of Canadian history, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the social gospel years of Canada, that perhaps there was some something we can learn that we have forgotten in the sense that maybe the foundation of the social gospel was the belief that God was at work in social change, creating moral order and social justice. That's an excerpt from the Canadian Encyclopedia. You can look it up online, the Canadian Encyclopedia, and it's an article on the social gospel. Maybe we've missed something. Maybe we left something behind. Maybe it was inconvenient as Al Gore's book, An Inconvenient Truth. Maybe there's stuff we want to sweep under the carpet. Maybe it's time that we lift the edges of the carpet and see what has been accumulated there. Ask some tough questions and be ready for some tough answers. Maybe the emperor has no clothes. The grace of uncertainty. Uh, The grace is basically to think of others more highly than ourselves. That's a biblical image. I'm not sure that we use it very much. At least they're not on Trump's TFT cards. Uh, I think he thinks he is everything for everybody. And what's the other biblical adage? Uh, Pride comes before a fall. Hmm. Here's hoping the January 6th commission has some insights for us. And uh, that's it for now. This is Terry signing off another installment of the book in progress. The book, The Grace of Uncertainty. Or leave your dogma at home. (laughs) All right, take care now. Bye-bye for now.